September 1st, 2022. Uh, my name is Nithya Raman, Council Member for the 4th District and Chair of this committee. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Council Member Blumenfield. Mr. Espinoza, can you please call the roll? Thank you. Um, Council Member Raman. Here. Council Member Blumenfield. Present. And Council Member Price. Council Member Price is currently absent, so that's two members and a quorum. Great. So today we have eight items to consider on the regular agenda, and we um, have three items on a, um, what is the word for it? Secondary agenda? Special, Special. agenda. Special agenda. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a, a blank in the mind. Um, and so I'm just going to go through the items for the regular agenda so that callers calling in know what we're considering. Item one is a motion about the sale of a property located at 12901 Venice Boulevard to the Disability Community Rights Center to build a 100% affordable housing project. Item two is a motion about a city-owned property inventory that identifies, um, in addition to identifying all of the properties uh, that we own, would also identify underutilized and surplus or remnant lands. Item three is a new lease agreement with Chirla um, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights and the Coalition for Responsible Community Development for office space located at 4255 South Olive Street. That's in Council District 9. Item 4 is a lease amendment to the contract with a new property owner um, for the continued use of a property at 4125 Crenshaw Boulevard, and that's currently being used by LAPD South Traffic Division. Item 5 and item six are both renewals of private line telecommunication franchises. One is to pace setter um, for the placement of conduit in the city public right of way at Telfair Avenue. Is that right? And then the second is uh, for the Performing Arts Center of LA County. Item seven is a CAL report about the third construction projects report um, for fiscal year 2022-23. And item eight is a verbal presentation from the California Community Foundation Digital Equity Initiative about their October 2022 Internet Pricing Disparities Report. And the, the report is titled, Slower and More Expensive Disparities in Advertised Pricing for Fast Reliable Broadband. So with, the, with that, I want to take public uh, comment on all items on the agenda. Speakers are going to have one minute if they're speaking on one item, two minutes if they're speaking on multiple items and one minute for general public comment if they want it. Mr. Espinoza, can you please provide instructions for people to call into this meeting? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-892-0108 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, my name is Safan Wade and I'm representing the African American Empowerment Coalition. We believe the very best policy goal we should all share in promoting the long-term sustainability of the ACP program. Thank you. Is that caller finished? Yes. Okay. Let's move on to the next caller, please. Okay. Caller with the last four digits, 9705. Please press star six to unmute. Please state your name and the items Hello. you speak on. Hi. Hello, my name is Josh uh, Landa. I'd like to speak on agenda item eight, the California Community, Founda Community Foundation Misleading Report. Uh, good morning. I wish Thank to speak you on have, item Sorry, eight. you have one minute for the item. Please begin. Okay. I'm speaking today to support immediate solutions to the digital divide. The most effective and cost efficient 
way to promote adoption is by ensuring programs such as the Affordable Connectivity Program are made sustainable and long-term. I am concerned that there is an organization on the agenda today that promotes a government monopoly as the best solution. This will hurt, not help our communities by wasting decades to build duplicative infrastructure, all while losing the opportunity to ensure the ACP and other subsidy, subsidy programs are made sustainable for the long term. The ACP is working to help real people in, in my community. I would also ask the City Council to help efforts to promote LAUSD's All Family Connected Program and use time and resources to expand the program and make it sustainable in the long term. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this important issue. Thank you. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Julian Canetti, uh, President and CEO of the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. And this morning I wish to speak on item eight and make general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and two, and one minute for general comments. So two minutes in total. Please begin. Thank you. As I stated, uh, my name is Julian Canetti. I'm President and CEO of the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. And this morning, members, uh, you, you will hear from the Cal uh, California Community Foundation will present a report on what they claim are internet price disparities in Los Angeles. We are disappointed that the foundation would make these unmerited claims against the fiercely competitive internet industry to mislead the public and un unsuspecting organizations. The CCF report glosses over the questions critical to solving the digital divide in favor of driving a political agenda that will continue to limit equitable access to broadband in the city of Los Angeles. If this committee has an interest in helping disadvantaged individuals and communities of color impacted by the digital, digital divide, you should, direct, you should direct your attention to the real long-term solution. Internet providers like Spectrum significant participation in the FCC's affordable connectivity subsidy program has helped millions of families located in low-income communities gain access to reliable and affordable high-speed in-home internet. We believe that the fastest, cheapest, and most effective way to address the digital divide is by making a robust existing urban Los Angeles broadband network available to those who need it through adoption and subsidy programs. Again, thank you for your time and hearing our comments. Thank you. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hey, Whitney O'Neill, items eight and general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total, please begin. Thank you. Good morning, chair and council member. I'm Whitney O'Neill, vice president of government affairs for Chartered Communications, known to our customers as Spectrum. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about our company and our longstanding and ongoing commitment to increasing connectivity in LA by addressing broadband availability, adoption, and affordability barriers. We've invested significant private support to expand our network equitably and make spectrum services available to virtually every household in the city in 98% of the county. Every residential household in every neighborhood that Charter serves in Los Angeles is serviced by the exact same fiber backbone infrastructure. We've continually upgraded our network and packages to provide fast, reliable products at great value. Spectrum has national uniform pricing for our services that do not vary by income, zip code, or neighborhood, all with no data caps, no, no uh, modem fees, and no annual contracts. Charter is providing important products equitably across the city, and any assertion to the contrary is untrue. The foundation's report ignores Charter's national pricing and ubiquitous service deployment and instead relies on point-in-time promotional offers that the company uses to attract new customers, which offers an opportunity to try our service for a period of time in hopes that they will come to recognize the quality and value and hopefully stay with us for many years to come. Let me be clear that the report under discussion on today's agenda is false and misleading. Charter does not, nor has it ever, based any deployment or pricing decisions on race, income, 
or other similar demographic information. The facts on the ground clearly demonstrate both Charter's previous efforts and ongoing commitments to increase connectivity equitably across LA and County, including through our many affordability programs, including our participation in the Affordable Connectivity Program. We're committed to continuing to invest in real solutions that help close the digital divide in Los Angeles and across our footprint. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Sarah Wiltfong and I'd like to speak on item eight. Thank you, you have one minute for the item, please begin. My name is Sarah Wiltfong and I'm with the Los Angeles County Business Federation, also known as BizFed, an alliance of over 230 business organizations who represent over 410,000 employers in Los Angeles County. We wanted to briefly address the presentation you're going to hear from the California Community Foundation today. BizFed has been working hard with major internet providers across LA County to address the digital divide and make broadband more available to all residents. We believe the divide is being driven more by low adoption rates, not a lack of broadband internet access. And we would like to note, contrary to the report, that Spectrum internet plans, speeds, and regular prices are exactly the same in every zip code they serve across their entire service area nationwide. We look forward to continuing our work with stakeholders across the region in order to address this gap more fully, using data that actually represents the issue in order to find real long-term solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, Estella Pacheco. I'd like to speak on item eight and make general public comments. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comments, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Senior Public Policy Manager with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. The LA Chamber supports immediate and sustainable solutions to the digital divide, which we believe is the best accomplished by working with existing providers to provide low cost or no cost programs to the neediest families. There have been successful policy innova innovations such as the affordable connectivity programs that are currently helping millions of families. Ensuring these types of programs are sustainable in the long term should be the goal that we all share. We should be working together to sustain and expand existing programs that are working. Our communities deserve real, immediate, and long-term solutions that incentivize investment rather than discourage it. We hope that moving forward, we can have a more united front when addressing this digital divide. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Christopher Gabriel, agenda item number eight in general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total, please begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Gabriel. I'm a long-term community organizer, um, former executive director of power and also a uh, seed fund member of the Liberty Hill Foundation. Um, and the reason why I, I say that is um, I know CCF and they're a fantastic organization that helps folks in Los Angeles. And I also say that um, because I'm a boots on the ground community organizer, door knocking, individual meetings, talking to folks, seeing folks every day. And you see folks that that do struggle with the $50, $60. You see folks struggling with the ability to pay sometimes these high internet charges. While the study that CCF puts out is really good at kind of walking through uh, a need to look at systemic or root causes of broadband inequity, I, I fear that it doesn't do adequate service to maybe talking about programs like ACT that help folks every day. I don't think we should discount, especially when you're on the ground and you're seeing folks struggling every day. Programs like ACT are positive. They make a positive impact in daily lives of Los Angelinos. And my thought is, is for the community members or the committee members to consider the fact that 
these programs like ACP are out there and shouldn't be dismissed. And we should also be, as we're talking about ways in which we can make everything more equitable, we should make sure that we include programs like ACP that do defray costs and help people get access to broadband internet. And are we having discussions about how we can get ACP more fully adopted, more fully funded, more support to these programs? Because it's not a silver bullet issue, right? It's not a magic wand issue. It's not one thing that we can do that's gonna solve everything. We have to look at different tiers and different ways in which we can approach this. And I'm talking about it from the community organizing perspective, boots on the ground perspective, Folks need help today, not in five years, 10 years, or 15 years. So what are we doing to help them today? And I think a good way is to look at programs like ACP, fully funding them and making sure they're implemented in broad and strategic ways. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last four digits, 7155, please press star six to unmute. Caller failed to unmute, we'll move on to the next caller. Good morning. Please state Hello. your name. Hi. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Item number eight and public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total. Please begin. Good morning. My name is Dylan Ariola, and I would like to read the statement of public comment for Mr. Ben Pack, President of Korean American Law Enforcement Organizations. <clears throat> I'll begin the statement. We are a nonprofit organization whose members are Korean American public safety officers serving your con constituents in the city and the county of Los Angeles. We are working closely with Asian American senior citizens to train, to train them on protecting themselves from anti-Asian violence that are occurring too frequently. By conducting these training sessions, we have observed important factors about digital access and the impact this has for Asian American immigrant communities. This has become so apparent during the COVID pandemic years. They have become more dependent on reliable internet service for healthcare needs, as well as daily needs for grocery and essential services and products. However, for many Asian American senior citizens, even after the quarantine mandate was lifted, many did not leave their home due to concern for their physical safety. This led to tremendous dependence for digital access, physical for physical and mental needs. For many, this was the only method to keep in touch with their family members. Even to this day, this has become the new normal for their life. For senior citizens that we work with, lack of digital infrastructure is not the problem of digital equity. There are many internet service providers in the County of Los Angeles that provide almost 100% access coverage. For Asian Americans, we assume for other senior citizen immigrant communities, affordable, affordability, ability to understand the technology and access to multilingual customer service are the key challenges. We believe that these are the challenges that the city and the county of Los Angeles need to undertake immediately. We need immediate solutions. We need to utilize existing federal and local funds that are available. Senior citizens should not and cannot wait for many years for an establishment of a publicly owned and created network. Thank you for your attention on this matter. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, this is Pastor Andre Chapel from the Faith Church LA and CEO of African American Empowerment Coalition. I would like to speak on item number eight and general comment. 
Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total. Please begin. Um, yeah, so to the, our distinguished council members, um, I had the opportunity to attend the town hall from CCF and they encouraged me personally to go do my own investigation. As a result, I had the chance to speak with some charter officials and um, a lot of what is presented in the report was some gross misrepresentations and we really take offense to that. I work um, daily with the African American Empowerment Coalition. We are the boots on the ground. Um, we meet with all of the community constituents that are in the low, hard to reach, hardly reach communities every single day. We're, we're advocating for them. Um, we also are uh, a conduit for the ACP program that we're sharing that. And with that $30 from ACP, um, and they're also getting their internet, they're getting free cell phones. The problem is not something that we need to politicize. It is something that we really need to look at as a social ill, you know, social problem, that we need to just get the word out about programs like ACP to help the community members, um, to do away with what the people who know what they're doing within this sector. Um, these, com these companies, the internet companies are doing a great job. We just have to really access and utilize and share this information with our community constituents uh, there to misrepresent um, the numbers, you know, Los Angeles County, four point, uh, uh, 3.8 million constituents live here and they pull 160, 60 something addresses was a gross misrepresentation. And we really take, take offense to that. You know, I think that the reporting should be accurate and um, that we don't politicize it. You know, we, we love the heart of what CCF is trying to do, but we want to make sure that it's done right. And if we can get more collaboration, if, if the government officials would collaborate with nonprofits like CCF, um, African American Empowerment Coalitions, get with those um, internet companies, Charter, Comcast, and all the rest of them, let's collaborate and come up with a solution instead of trying to politicize it. Um, this is Pastor Andre Chapel. Thank you. Thank you, caller. I uh, just wanted to comment that this is the most number of callers I believe we've ever had in this committee. So. Hi. Hi, good morning. Please good morning. take your uh, you wish to speak on. Yes, uh, my name is Donald Harlan. I'd like to speak on agenda item number two, three, four, and a general comment. Thank you. You have two um, minutes in total. Sorry, you have two minutes in total for the items and one minute for general comments. So three minutes in total. Please begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to comment on general uh, item number two. Uh, this is about uh, city city owned property. Yeah, that's a real crime. Uh, it says on there, Bonin and uh, uh, Ramen. Uh, they're the ones uh, trying to commit real estate fraud there. Uh, yeah, there's no city properties for you to sell uh, in the government. That's a real crime, what you guys are doing. Uh, they're illegally declaring public property. Those are private property. And you think that if you name them city properties, that they belong to the city? They do not. Uh, and also, okay, agenda item number three. 4225 South Olive Street, that's, that, that's a modified address. That assessor report for that property has been modified. They don't have the correct owner for that property. 4255, agenda item number three, South Olive Street. No due diligence. You guys are just in there committing real estate fraud making illegal deals. You know, those people illegally developing that property, they get busted, and then you spend government money furthering the fraud, paying them for that. You want to use it to, for affordable housing, and you want to use it for uh, all kinds of stuff. What about the fraud they committed when they started building that property in the first place? The city doesn't own it. That's not your property to declare public property. Agenda item number four. 4125 Crenshaw Boulevard. Uh, yeah, that address is not, not correct. You know what? That's another property that doesn't belong to the person that says on there. Look at the ass county assessor report there. It's been modified and redivided not less than 10 times. What a crime going on in there. The LAPD is in there? 
So the LAPD's in there illegally in the property that was used to up, obtained illegally. Somebody committed a crime, and they're in there making deals for it still. They're using government money to pay for this fraud. I mean, when are they going to bust you guys in there? You guys need to go to – I'm not kidding. People need to pay attention to what you guys are doing. You caused the homeless crisis. When you illegally develop a piece of real estate and you block the regular owner, the real owner, from owning their property, you've contributed to the homeless crisis. Not only that, there's a political crisis. We have politicians breaking their way through the government selling real estate that they don't own. We have them making deals with foreign agents for Americans' real estate. That's, that's their traitors. How are you allowing this to continue? The city and the, the local Los Angeles government, they caused the, ha the homeless crisis and these ho affordable problems. You guys don't have the property owner. You're just in there declaring public property. It's just total insanity what you guys are doing. I mean, you're the cause of it, and you're just in there, hey, let's fix the problem, making more public property. You know, I'm the owner of a lot of that property, and I need to be paid for that. I have a constitutional right to be reimbursed for my property if the government wants to declare it public property, if they find a legal decision for that to be. But I haven't been asked. I haven't been paid. I haven't been called to court. Nothing. Just a bunch of crazy people, politicians in there making up, hey, I want to build stuff and uh, I want a political favor for uh, illegal housing development. When are they going to stop you guys? So ridiculous. Go ahead. Thank you, caller. That was three minutes. Next caller. <clears throat> caller with the last four digits, seven, six, seven, four. Please press star six to unmute. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning. My name is Shirley Taylor, and I would like to speak on item eight. Thank you. You have one minute for and that. And make a general comment. Okay. So you have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total. Please begin. Thank you. Once again, my name is Shirley Taylor, and I am with Faith Church and African American Empowerment Coalition. Today, you will hear a presentation from the California Community Foundation on a report which is rife with misinformation and distorts the realities of digital access to meet their preferred narratives, thereby distracting us from real solutions. The facts show that the digital divide is being driven by the low adoption rates, not a lack of broadband and internet access. As the broadband adoption organization, everyone on rightly states, the problem is not tech technological, not technological, sorry, but a social one. But the CCF report glosses over these in favor of driving a political agenda that will continue to limit equity, equitable access in broadband in Los Angeles. If this committee has an interest in lifting up the voices of Angelinos impacted by the digital divide, it should direct its attention to the real long-term solutions. Given that Los Angeles has multiple broadband and mobile providers across the variety of technologies, why does the report only focus on a specific company and only connectivity to certain? The, um, it seems to address only some of the promotions customers receive on one single project product or from one company and ignores all the other providers and connectivity products like mobile service. We believe in comprehensive approach to address the digital divide, which requires the availability of the internet network, affordability of services, and adoption of services. 
The FCC's Affordable Connectivity Subsidy Program has helped millions of families located in low-income communities of color and gains access to reliable and affordable high-speed internet, home internet. We believe the very best policy goal would be to share in promoting the long-term sustainability of the ACP program. Given Los Angeles has extensive broadband infrastructure, and we have multiple programs such as the Affordable Connectivity Program subsidiary, subsidiary and LAUSD free internet program that can eliminate and greatly reduce the cost of service. We encourage the committee to focus on promoting these programs and committees and advocate for these long-term sustainability. And additionally, we have long advocated that government-owned networks are the worst solution for the digital divide. The bottom line is we believe that the fastest, cheapest, and the most effective way to address the digital divide is by making the existing network available to those who need it and those, and through adoption and subsidiary programs. We hope that you will focus on the real solutions to the digital divide instead of misleading distractions like those by this report. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Lori Houston and I'm representing the African American Empowerment Coalition and I would like to make public comment. Thank you. You on, have uh, item number eight. So just, you just want to speak on the item, no public comment or both? Yes, public comment. Okay, so. I want to make. Um, okay, so you have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total, please begin. Okay. Um, again, I'm Lori Houston with the African American Empowerment Coalition, and the bottom line, we believe that the fastest, cheapest, and most effective way to address the digital divide is by making the existing network available to those who need it through adoption and subsidy programs. We hope you will focus on real solutions to the digital divide instead of misleading distractions like those promulgated by this report. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, caller with the last four digits, 0627. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, I'm Dyshan Washington. I wish to speak on item eight and make a general public comment. Thank you, you have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment. So two minutes in total, please begin. Good morning, I'm Dyshan Washington. I am with the African American Empowerment Coalition. Um, today's presentation from the California Community Foundation um, is filled with misinformation and greatly distorts the realities of digital access to meet their preferred narrative, thereby distracting us from real solutions. The facts show the digital divide is being driven by low adoption rates and not a lack of broadband internet access. As the broadband adoption organization, everyone on rightly states, the problem is not technological, but it is a social problem. But the CCF report glosses over these, over these in favor of driving a political agenda that will continue to limit equitable access to broadband in Los Angeles. We believe in a comprehensive approach uh, to address the digital divide, which requires the availability of an internet network, affordability of services, and adoption of services and the FCC's Affordable Connectivity Subsidy Program has helped millions of families located in low-income communities of color gain access to reliable and affordable high-speed in-home internet. So therefore, we believe the very best policy goal we should all share 
is promoting the long-term sustainability of the ACP program. We believe the fastest, cheapest, and most effective way to address the digital divide is by making the existing network available to those who really need it through adoption and subsidy programs. And we hope that today you will focus on real solutions to the digital divide instead of misleading distractions like those promulgated by this report. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yes, good morning. My name is Ms. Krishi Salas. I'd like to speak on item eight. So my concern is that there is no organ. I'm sorry, you have one minute. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, you have one minute for the item. Please begin. I'm concerned that there, this organization on the agenda today, that it promotes a government monopoly as best solution. This will hurt and not help our communities by wasting decades of build duplicate infrastructure, all while losing the opportunity to ensure that ACP and other subsidy programs are made sustainable for the long term. The ACP is working to help pe real people in my community. I also would like to say that the City Council would like to help promote LAUSD's All Families Connected Program and use the time to resources to expand the programs and make it sustainable in long term. Thank you for all of your opportunities to speak today. My final point, City of Los Angeles, our government needs to spend more time in its priorities of solving homelessness and decreasing time instead of spending billions on broadband infrastructure that already exists. This is what the election was all about. And another thing i like to add is water. We need to start focusing as Californians on saving water. We are very wasteful. We could prevent a lot of the high prices that are going on that are killing people, literally, in so many levels because of the stress, when we have all the opportunities to be able to save our own water, conserve water. Let's look at Israel and their water conservation and what they've been doing. And they're brilliant. We can do that as Californians in this country. Thank you so much again. My name is Ms. Trishy. I am a volunteer with the Women's Neighborhood Council. I'm an executive board member. I'm here representing myself and also CPAP, Community Police Advisory Board Member, Block Thank Watch for color. 40 years. Have a blessed day. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, hello. My name is Victor Reyes, and I would like to speak on item eight and general public comment. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comment, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Hello. My name is Victor Reyes, and I am the legislative manager with VICA, Valley Industry Commerce Association. VICA has long advocated that government-owned networks are the worst solutions for the digital divide. We believe that the fastest, cheapest, and most effective way to address the digital divide is by making the existing network available to those who need it through adoption programs. We believe that the fast, uh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> this is currently being accomplished by LAUSD's All Family Connected Program, which provides high speed internet at no cost to unconnected student families and the affordable uh, connectivity program. Um, ensuring that these types of programs are sustainable in the long run is very essential and would be the, um, the most important thing to have uh, implemented. But the organizations on today's agenda does not share this goal. The irony is that the so-called solutions that are calling for would turn a competitive marketplace into a public monopoly. We believe that this exacerbates the digital divide by wasting resources on a boondoggle that would otherwise be used for long-term sustainable solutions. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Please state your name and the yes, items hello. you wish to speak on. Thank you. My name is Isela Martinez and I'm speaking on item number eight. Thank you. So you have one minute for the item. Please begin. Thank you. Um, I was just calling to, to let you guys know, I am a resident of downtown LA and I am also a principal at a school. Um, and just asking that for the sake of our students who have been greatly affected by COVID, that you will increase access and adoption immediately, especially for our students and struggling families. Um, that is really what is important right now. As a, 
As a downtown resident, I ask that you guys focus on the homelessness and the crime issues and not spend billions of dollars on a broadband infrastructure that is already in place. Rather than spend all that money on an infrastructure that is all already in place, um, let's spend those billions on building affordable housing. Uh, we need to spend more on that and not broadband infrastructure. I'm really, really tired of dealing with the homeless issues and um, this item will only make things worse. So please do not spend that money, or please, please, yes, please do not spend that money on, on a new broadband infrastructure. Spend it on where, where we really need it, which is dealing with homelessness and crime. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Tischer, and I wish, I wish to provide public comment for item number eight. Perfect. So you have one minute for the item. Please begin. Great. I'm speaking today to support immediate solutions to the digital divide, the most effective and cost of way to promote adoption by ensuring programs such as the Affordable Connectivity Program are made sustainable and long-term. I am concerned that there is an organization on the agenda today that might promote a government monopoly as the best solution. Uh, this will hurt, not help our communities by wasting potentially decades uh, of time to build duplicative infrastructure, all while losing the opportunity to ensure ACP and other subsidy programs are made sustainable for the long-term. The ACP is working to help real people uh, in Los Angeles. And I would like to ask the city council uh, to help efforts to promote LAUSD's all family connected program and to use the time and resources to expand the program to make it sustainable in the long term. I really appreciate everyone's time and thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, good morning. My name is Ray. I'm speaking on items eight and uh, general comments. Thank you. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general comments, so two minutes in total. Please begin. Thank you so much. Good morning, committee members. Uh, my name is Ray Lopez Chang, speaking on behalf of GPSN. We are an activator and convener of 70 organizations uh, who work directly with our highest need communities of Los Angeles. We represent a cross-section of community-based organizations who work in education, housing, environmental justice, health equity, immigration, economic mobility. Folks, I am a child through and through of Los Angeles, a child of refugees and raised in LA areas that have low quality broadband infrastructure, just like the many constituencies that our organizations serve. The conversation on digital equity is absolutely political. Black and brown communities have historically undergone housing redlining and are now experiencing cyber redlining. This is not new information, folks. This is alarming information. And internet service providers have had over 30 years to collaborate with communities, and yet here we are. CCF's report, we know, uplifts an important conversation that ISPs were not addressing until now that there's noise being made. ISPs are not providing free internet either through LAUSD. They're getting reimbursed by the Affordable Connectivity Program and receiving public education dollars through government contracts. What a comprehensive approach looks like to digital equity would mean that the city of LA, in addition to other government municipalities, have the gumption, ability, and power to establish their own locally owned networks, which we know works as it has worked across many cities across this country. Committee members, I want to affirm that your unique positionality puts you in a decision-making seat to have genuine impact in LA, one that is driven by your moral compass and not financial aspirations. We encourage you to leverage your strength and leadership to remain on the socially just side of history. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Good morning, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jorge Rivera and I'd like to speak on item number eight. Thank you. You have one minute for the item. Please begin. 
Uh, good morning, committee members. Uh, my name is Jorge Rivera, executive co-director of the People's Resource Center. We are a community-based nonprofit and advocacy organization. And I wanted to, to speak on the this idea of uh, digital equity and sort of like bridging the, the divide. Uh, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge the, the truth that uh, the charter spectrum is a monopoly in the city of Los Angeles as well as Los Angeles County. And so the idea that we, uh, by us advocating for digital equity, we are sort of gearing and redirecting people to a govern government monopoly seems to be ridiculous. And also, I want to uh, point to the fact that uh, the ACP program only exists because that, uh, that it was highlighted during COVID that so many people were not able to access the internet and also the resources. And, and the, the reality is that ACP program shouldn't exist if the internet service providers were truly offering affordable and available accessibility to connect to the internet, that ACP program should not even be there. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that uh, the, the, this pricing report that was put out by CCF and our coalition members really shows that there is an issue and we are urging the committee to further investigate this. If Charter Spectrum is, is trying to fight against the claims, brought out by the report, then have them show us the data. Have them present the data to really, really refute those claims. And we've spoken to Charter Spectrum and they say that these are uh, customer acquisition strategies as they call them. And even if they are customer acquisition strategies, the fact that they are offering lower prices in higher income communities is discriminatory and needs to be investigated. This pricing report highlights an issue and I think that it befalls on you as committee members as we're thinking about renewing their contract that you investigate it further. And if there's nothing to find and if it's true that it's not, uh, it's not an issue, then have Charter show the data so that they can disprove us. Thank you so very much for your time. There are no more callers in the queue, Councilwoman. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Armida, for um, handling that uh, comment session. I did want to just um, preface our discussion today with uh, uh, just a comment for our callers and for our listeners that we are just hearing the report from the California Community Foundation today, which talks about their discovery of potential pricing disparities in internet access um, in the city of Los Angeles and in some of the surrounding neighborhoods. And uh, that is all. We're just hearing that report. We're going to be taking that into account as we think about these issues moving forward. We're not actually uh, making any decisions or policy decisions today, but I appreciate that um, callers feel strongly about this issue. And I think based on the amount of interest that there is from the public um, on this issue, it feels like it's certainly worthy of further discussion with, with all of the players at the table. And we're looking forward to hearing this report today as a means of kicking off that discussion, um, because I know that digital equity and digital access is something that the entire council is really concerned about. Um, I'm gonna recommend that um, we have eight items on the uh, regularly scheduled agenda. I'm going to recommend that we take items two through seven on consent, unless there's any objections from. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, Mr. Espinoza, are you going to call the roll on those consent items? Yes, I will call the roll, Madam Chair. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. And Council Member Price. Council Member Price is absent, so that's two ayes, and these items are approved on consent. Okay, let's start with item one. This is going to be a brief item. Mr. Espinoza, can you please read the item into the record? Thank you, Madam Chair. Item one is a motion from Council Members Bonin and Raman relative to the private sale of property located at 12901 Venice Boulevard to the Disability Community Rights Center to, uh, to build a 100% affordable housing project and related matters. I just wanted to, uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to um, have a separate vote on this item because I just wanted to make one brief comment on it for any listeners um, to this committee um, and for other committee members, which is that when I, I seconded this item uh, when it came, um, when it was first presented, but I had a 
a few questions on what the land disposition process looks like in the city of Los Angeles for, for land that we own um, and how this particular transaction conforms with the general city process that we follow for all uh, land disposition. So I was able to get some clarification on this. Um, the essentially, as this motion moves forward, there will be opportunities to ensure that this sale conforms with the process that's been set out by the city overall um, and to get clarity on that process as we move forward. So I'm comfortable moving this forward, but I did just want to present an opportunity um, to clarify that um, for, for the public as, as we move this forward. Um, Mr. Bloomfield, did you have any additional comments or questions here? No, I mean, this is just, as you said, this is just the step one, asking them to do the ordinance and take the first step. So I'm, I'm fine with this. Okay, great. Um, with that clarified, Mr. Espinoza, can you call the roll on this item? Thank you. Councilmember Raman? Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield? Aye. And Councilmember Price is absent, so that's two ayes, and this item is approved. Great. So let's get to item eight, um, which obviously is a... Um, a, a report of generating a lot of interest from the public. Mr. Espinoza, can you read the item into the record, please? Thank you. Item number eight is the verbal presentation from the California Community Foundation Digital Equity Initiative relative to their October 2022 Internet Pricing Disparities re Report entitled Slower and More Expensive Disparities in Advertising Advertised Pricing for Fast Reliable Broadband. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited that we have Shana Englin and Jarrett Barrios here from the California Community Foundation. Um, for those of you who don't know the work of this foundation, it is, uh, I think, one of the most well-regarded and one of the largest players uh, in our local philanthropic scene, driving forward an agenda that's really, I think, central to how we as a region have addressed issues related to inclusivity, access, and justice. This uh, report uh, that, that the two of you are going to be sharing some of your findings on talks about disparities in pricing that you found uh, for fast, reliable broadband in LA. We've had quite a few discussions on this committee about digital inclusion and broadband equity, and we're going to continue doing so as a council. I think particularly after the pandemic, this issue um, burst into the forefront. I'm still um, remembering vividly that image of the two young children sitting outside of a fast food establishment um, and utilizing internet from that, um, um, I think it was a, a, a McDonald's. And, and just, it, I think it, it was the Im an image that circulated around the country um, and, and brought to light how important this issue is, how essential broadband and internet access has become for people, um, how people are thinking about it like they think about water and power as an essential part of life and, and how we move forward. And so I think it's really important for us to be able to center these questions in our work, to think about this in this committee. Um, and I'm really excited to have the both of you here to present the findings from your report. So I turn it over to you. Thank you, Council Member Raman. Uh, and through you, uh, Council Member Blumenfield, uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with both of you today. Uh, my name is Jared Tomas Barrios. I am the Senior Vice President uh, for Programmatic Initiatives at the California Community Foundation. With me today is my colleague, Shana Anglin, who oversees our Digital Equity uh, Initiative. I uh, want to note uh, at the beginning, Shana is going to share the screen. Um, I'm not sure if there we go. Uh, if that's okay, uh, we're going to uh, scroll through. I'm going to start, and then I'm going to hand it off to her to present uh, the findings. Council Member? Yes, I just wanted to interrupt for one second just to say, ask um, our, uh, Mr. Espinoza, is there a place where listeners can access the PowerPoint presentation on the council file? Is that available yet? It's not available yet, but I could see if I could get that available as quickly as possible. not seeing Sorry about that I was muted um, oh. it's not available yet but I'm working with your staff right now to see how quickly we could get that available okay fantastic and um, for anyone who's listening in the report is available on the California Community Foundation website 
under the uh, tab called publications um, and you can find uh, the entire report there. So it, they're not missing anything. All right, uh, back to you. Awesome, thank you, uh, council member and madam chair. Uh, uh, you cited uh, the uh, the image during COVID of the two girls. That uh, that image inspired us. It was actually a Taco Bell. Uh, it was in Northern California in Monterey County, but it could have just easily been in LA County. And what we learned, what all of us saw during COVID was that access to broadband is no longer a luxury, that it is absolutely essential. And the provision of broadband is effectively like the provision of any other service we might deem a utility. And for that reason, we think there is a special interest for government and policymakers to ensuring everybody can access fast, reliable, and affordable broadband. You've meant we've heard a lot of folks talking about the schools today and children during COVID relied on it, but not just children, families relied on it when they sought to sign up for a vaccine appointment or just get regular medical care. When people tried to sign up for benefits like CalFresh or unemployment, um, they needed broadband because the offices were closed. This essential nature is critical. Uh, we are, as we launch, I want to just sort of set the context for what this is. You heard some of the speakers talk about the key problem being the low adoption rate, and that is 1000% correct. And what is the largest driver, as reported by consumers, of the low adoption rate is the high cost for low income families of broadband. That is the chief driver, and that has been the focus of this report. I want to just also go on record, uh, Council Member, and say that we love the affordable connectivity program, uh, but it is not a long term solution. It is a subsidy, it is government dollars buying down the price of broadband. And at some point, those dollars will stop flowing and we won't have solved the systems change challenge, right, of more affordable broadband. So how do we do that? Well, uh, a lot of folks have been talking about uh, government owned stuff. That may be the case. We aren't actually opining on that in this report. What we are trying to focus on is what we observed when we drilled down on this high cost of broadband issue. That we saw as reported by consumers, and as we will share with you in this report, that not everybody pays the same price for the same thing, uh, at least as people are reporting and as uh, as is offered on the broadband uh, providing websites, and in particular, Charter Spectrum. Shana England, my colleague, will explain why much of the focus is on Charter Spectrum, and but the basic reason is they're the only entity that covers almost the entire county. So statistically speaking, we could do apples to apples with this. The goal isn't to target any particular provider, but to point out that there are very concerning inequities in how which zip codes, which census tracts get charged more and less. Uh, and I'm going to, with that, just ask Shana to go to the next slide. I'll say a little bit about our coalition, and then we'll get into the report. So we, uh, CCF has the honor of working with Digital Equity Los Angeles. Um, there are about 70 organizations. We couldn't fit them all, and at least my older eyeballs couldn't still read them if all 70 were there. But many of the organizations who are very active are listed here. These are organizations who, through their substantive work, have found that broadband is essential uh, to the communities they serve, thus their engagement uh, in the Digital Equity Los Angeles Coalition. At this point, I'm going to invite my colleague Shana Engling to walk you through the report, and then we'd be happy, uh, Madam Chair, to take any questions that you have after. Thank you, Jared, and, uh, and thank you, council members, for the time and the, the attention to this really important issue. Um, we'll get into the details of the report, but I honestly couldn't summarize it better than the Los Angeles Times did, <laughs> uh, which is that our study found inequity in internet charges uh, and that uh, wealthier communities across LA County um, are routinely advertised lower prices for better service um, than, uh, than lower income communities. Uh, having my own internet issues, apologies. <laughs> um, hopefully you're still seeing the, uh, yep. the slide deck. Yes, okay. But you need to maximize it, Shana. There we go, all there right. 
Um, so here's what we did. We, uh, again, as Jarrett said, work with a, a very wide range of organizations that do work every single day in community, communities across the county focused on an extremely wide range of issues, whether it's tenant organizing or working with parents and students um, at school districts, not actually just LAUSD, but again, across the county, um, the Community Clinics Association and healthcare providers, et cetera. And what we were hearing um, was that this affordability challenges was were significant um, and that really was the significant barrier. And then pair that with other research that has been published, survey data year after year for actually more than a decade now. Again, documenting that people say that the reason they do not have internet at home is that they can't afford it. And so we really just wanted to look at and say, all right, what are people being asked to pay when they say they can't afford what is on offer, what's on offer? Um, and so we started to look at, uh, we, we started to just shop for internet service. And we were shopping for internet service at the largest providers in LA County. And when we first set out to do it, we said, okay, we're going to shop for internet at every provider that provides residential service to at least two and a half percent of LA County. It's like, it was a, it seems like a, a reasonable enough number. Um, what we found that is that per the internet providers and retired regulatory reporting, there are three that meet that. The first is Charter Spectrum. And as they have, have said, they provide service to something like 97% or say they can provide service to something like 97% of LA County. The next biggest provider in LA County, again, per ISP reports to the California Public Utilities Commission um, is Frontier. And they're at about 20%, and then AT&T, and they're at about 15%. So for most folks in LA County, if you want wireline uh, uh, internet at your home, you can you will have access to Charter Spectrum. And if you're lucky, you might have access also to Frontier or also to AT&T. But Charter Spectrum really is our monopoly provider here in LA County. And that's why so much of our data um, is Charter Spectrum, because when you go shopping for internet service, that's your option um, in most of LA County. Can you just say one more time, what was the cutoff barrier you used? You said 2.5%? 2.5%. That that a provider could provide internet to at least 2.5% of residents? Of LA County residents, okay. yeah. Um, and af after Frontier, it goes down to um, Cox, which was at about 1.5%. But only in Rancho Palos Verdes and some neighborhoods in Torrance. Um, so we again just kind of went shopping, um, and we started with kind of what we were hearing from our communities, and said, "Okay, well, we did a lot of work in the southeast LA cities, and so they were saying, okay, this is what I heard from the people that we just worked with. Here's an address. Let's look it up.'" <laughs> and we did, um, and then we looked up an address in Beverly Hills, and to compare say, all right, you have this, this city versus this city, here's what's being offered. And we were dismayed and really surprised to find a very significant disparity. And so the more that we looked, the more we found those disparities and what was being offered. Um, and so decided to do something um, kind of systemic. Um, and so we looked at at least one address in every city um, and then added uh, kind of oversampling in lower income census tracts and in, um, higher income census tracts, higher po uh, lower poverty and higher poverty. Um, and what we found was uh, that there was a really consistent pattern um, for Charter Spectrum of their best offers. And I want to be really clear, we uh, everything in here is based on what Charter Spectrum is advertising to these addresses. So at any of these addresses, if you moved to that address and tried to get Charter Spectrum service, this is what would be available to you as published on their website. Um, and that pattern was, again, they reserved their very best offers for the wealthiest census tracts in the county. And not only that, but those offers were good for a longer period of time. And again, we'll, I'll sh we'll show you some screenshots to kind of make this real. Um, but that if you were living in a lower income neighborhood, you would pay more for longer um, than if you were living in a higher income neighborhood. And lastly, we were just made to find uh, that the low cost plans were not consistently offered to addresses in low income neighborhoods. And again, we have some screenshots to document that. So 
here's the, the case study number one. And as you can see, for every single address in the study, we do have screenshots that we're more than happy to share and make public. It's literally in a Google Doc. Um, so uh, this, this looks at addresses, an address in Watts versus an address in Manhattan Beach. And according to the Census Department, the poverty rate uh, for the census tract that that address in Watts is located in is 31%. I'll also say that that address, that census tract is 94% non-white. And you can see that the uh, their advertised price for Internet Ultra from Spectrum at that address is $70 a month. And if you look at the very tiny print underneath that $69.99, it says for 12 months. Over in Manhattan Beach, in a community that has a 2% poverty rate, that's for that census tract, that same Internet Ultra was on offer for $30 a month. And again, if you zoom in on that tiny print underneath the $29.99, that says for 24 months. And that's what we mean by uh, disparate terms and conditions is the length of time that these um, price different differences uh, persist. And you can also see in this screenshot that uh, the slowest service that is offered in Manhattan Beach is their internet that goes up to 300 megabits per second. And they're offering that for $20 a month and that's a price good for 24 months, um, which I would just note is less than um, what they are charging, or just $2 more than what they're charging for internet assist, which in the poorer community, which barely qualifies as broadband, and is less than what they're offering for internet 100, uh, which they're saying card charging $30 a month, again, for just that one, I think is actually for two years um, in Watts. So this is a the, the kind of example of what we were finding. Another another example of that, um, Silmar. So these addresses are walkable. These are. Right, Shana, could I just ask one uh, question about that previous of slide? Um, of course. It says up top you qualify for internet at no cost. What what is that? So that is their that's their affordable connectivity program advertisement. So they're saying that um, if you enroll in the affordable connectivity program and purchase that internet 100, that you will not pay out of pocket. Okay. And I think per one of the, the callers, I think it's really important to clarify that this that doesn't mean that Spectrum is offering free internet at that address. It means that the government subsidy will cover the cost. So Spectrum is still getting paid $30 a month for that service. It's just if this household can successfully enroll in the ACP, then that cost won't be coming out of their pocket. And that qualification for the internet at no cost, is that coming based on the income level of the applicant or is that coming based on the geographic location of where you're looking for service? It's the applicant. Thanks. So same here actually is, is a good example of where that isn't offered in a community where this household would likely qualify. So this is Silmar, um, uh, so what about seven blocks away from each other? And you see, again, all the way up the line, those same disparities in what's offered. And uh, here, there actually was no advertisement for that ACP. Um, I will say a two charters credit, um, and it's important, I think, to acknowledge where progress is being made, um, that we have seen a real uptick in where, in the kind of where these are, the ACP is being advertised and the kind of aggressiveness with which it's being advertised. So in um, looking at uh, at examples more recently, we have seen that they have like a pop-up that says, do you think you qualify for free internet and things like that. So um, I will say that at some of these addresses, if we were to look at them today, we might see ACP covered. Um, we do continue to see though the pricing disparities um, in terms of those advertised offers. And so how far that $30 will go. And then um, lastly, uh, Compton and Mar Vista. So this one, as you all know, uh, separated by Culver City, about five miles as, as the, uh, the crow flies. Um, we have an address in Crenshaw, a census tract that is, uh, has a poverty rate of 30% versus one in Mar Vista, a poverty rate of 1%. And you can see all the way down the line, um, there are really significant disparities in the advertised pricing. And again, you have to really squint, um, but those really good prices in Mar Vista all say for 24 months and the higher but still promotional prices in um, in uh, Crenshaw are all at, um, for those are just good for 12 months before they're all going to go up. 
and you'll hear and have heard, I think, in, in the um, in the comments provided both by the the charter call-ins and also some of their folks um, today, and in in some of their published responses, you'll hear about a national pricing model, and that the kind of base standard pricing for all of these is exactly the same based on a national pricing model. Um, and we'd say two things. One is we were actually able um, just this morning to track down the page on the website that links to what those national pricing models are. Um, and we're happy to, if we can find it again, share that link. Um, but our point here, and we've been very, very clear, is that we're focused on what is actually being offered to a consumer. So if you move to one address versus another, or if you live in one address versus another and you want to get service from Charter, you don't get offered these kind of mythical national pricing. You, this is what you're offered. This is what your option is. And what your options are are much worse in, um, in pretty systemically in low income communities than in higher income communities. Um, and we'll also just say about that, and we don't have a slide on it, um, we can come back and present it. We also did a survey of we are now at over 2,200 responses from across California, representing 41 of our 58 counties in the state, um, asking them just what do you pay for internet? Who do you pay and what do you pay for? And out of those survey responses, we have 430 that um, get their internet service from Spectrum and something like 250 of them pay for um, Spectrum internet, this 300 megabits per second. And they reported paying monthly prices anywhere from twenty to one hundred and fifty dollars. So there may be um, a theoretical national national pricing model. We don't see any evidence of it in terms of how it is that you can purchase internet from Spectrum or in what people report their experiences. And so I want to just sort of zoom out a little bit. I keep saying this sort of systemic uh, situation. This is a snapshot of um, what we found in terms of advertised prices for Internet Ultra across the addresses that we looked at in South LA and then a few miles away in Mar Vista. You can see for every single address that we looked at in those two communities, there was a, at that time, $40 disparity in the advertised monthly rate. And I wanna make the connection here between, why, between the pricing and adoption. As Jarrett mentioned, we agree. Adoption is, a, is the significant issue. People tell us that the reason they don't adopt is because they can't afford it. And the data actually really backs that up. So if we look at, these are all census tracts. We look at, uh, kind of keep in mind that map that I just showed you that had that really consistent $40 difference in advertised pricing um, for the internet ultra package. Um, these are the census tracts where those addresses are in. In South LA, adoption rates are consistently always lower. So th that turquoise means that 60 to 80% of households in that census tract um, have adopted, so have a broadband subscription at home at at least the 25.3, which is the slowest service that qualifies federally as broadband. Um, there is not a single census tract in South LA that has an adoption rate um, higher than that 60 to 80% range. Whereas you can go over to Mar Vista, where you saw much better advertised pricing, and lo and behold, all but one of those census tracts have adoption rates of 80% or above. So we think it's really important to draw the connection between, yes, like adoption is a really significant challenge and the significant challenge, and it is deeply connected to price. And then again, just kind of the, these are sort of some details, but just to kind of pull up again on and why why it is that we feel comfortable to continue to say this is a systemic issue. Um, these are these are comparing just the addresses in low poverty census tracts versus those in high poverty census tracts. And the numbers here, so according to the American Community Survey, the LA county wide um, poverty rate across all county census tracts is 14.2%. So we rounded up and said, all right, if you live in a census tract that is has a poverty rate below 15%, we're gonna call that low poverty and then double it. And so if you're in a census tract that's 30% or higher, that's a high poverty census tract. And looking just at those two data sets um, for Charter Spectrum Internet Ultra, there's an average of a $16 per month uh, worse offer 
for in the um, high poverty census tracts. AT&T had the same pricing. We're going to get in a second to some of the issues with the AT&T piece, but their price is the same. Um, and then Frontier, we actually didn't find any high poverty addresses that had access to Frontier. And Shana, if I could interrupt, this is Michael Spinoza of the City Clerk. I just want to let everyone know that this can be, the presentation can be found at LA City Clerk, or what is it, LACouncilFile.com by um, going to Council File number 22-111141-S9, and the document is entitled California Community Foundation Digital Equity. So I just want to let the public know that. And that's on that, that's on the council file related to it's this a, agenda. Exactly. Agenda. Well, it's it, there's no council file listed because it is um, it, it's a verbal presentation. So we did add it to the general public comment comment file. And again, that's twenty two dash one 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 dash s nine. Okay. And can you just say the URL one more time? Thank you. That is lacouncilfile.com. dot com. Thank you. Uh, so the, the last couple of pieces is want to indicate at the same time as we were doing our research here in LA County and unbeknownst to us, um, an independent media um, organization called The Markup in collaboration with the Associated Press um, was also doing the same thing. Instead of doing kind of manual shopping at addresses, they actually developed um, tools that would just scrape the internet service providers um, sales websites but for the exact same data, the advertised pricing in terms. Um, they have 850,000 data points from 38 cities across the country, including Los Angeles. Um, and what they found was for AT&T and for CenturyLink, while they were charging the same exact price, they were charging that price, it was $55 a month generally, $55 a month for um, sometimes extremely slow service in um, high poverty, uh, non-white communities. Um, or whereas that $55 would buy you up to like gigabit service in wider, wealthier communities. And looking in just at their LA, um, at their city of LA data, they found that 50% um, of addresses were offered slow internet speed um, in lower income areas versus 30% in higher income areas. So kind of similar methodology, similar findings, um, different company and kind of different, different specifics. And then lastly, wanted to address some of the, um, the kind of questions, which we think, you know, what part of the reason we, we publish research is to, uh, to ask questions and to encourage questions. So I want to address some of those. Um, one is just regarding, regarding the, uh, the ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Subsidy Program. Um, and we raised this in the report um, that one of our concerns is that if it turns out that pricing for high-speed internet is higher in those lower income communities where lower income households are likely to be, um, then the effectiveness of that subsidy to those private companies may really be diminished. Um, so again, if it's $30 in public money that's intended to make high-speed internet affordable, that is going as a, it is a corporate subsidy, it is going to the corporation, not to the household. And then that is buying slower service, that's probably not an excellent use of that public money. And, and ultimately won't meet the goals. And so that's a really significant question we think we need to be answered. And then also just want to point to research published by, um, among many others, but uh, USC's Dr. Ernan Kalbrin. And what he found was that after two years now of really a significant amount of data on the emergency broadband program, which was uh, the predecessor, the precursor to the affordable connectivity program, um, that most of that money actually went to households that already had internet connectivity and just made it more affordable for them, which isn't nothing, but um, it didn't actually do much in terms of getting households who were not connected at all um, online. And then again, as Jared had mentioned earlier, we, we believe that, uh, that kind of short-term programs like ACP and subsidies are going to be really important um, in this mix. We also think it's important to note, though, that those are not permanent systemic long-term solutions. And then lastly, on this note of kind of collaborating, yes, uh, this is a screenshot from the report 
that we like we anticipated that there would be some of these uh, these objections, um, and we firmly believe that if we got this wrong, fine. Like we are, we would we would love to find that we just by accident found uh, all of these examples of disparities. Um, but we believe it's important enough that it deserves more than just assertions from the private companies that we got it wrong, but that they should they should be engaging with us collaboratively to actually surface data to demonstrate that um, and, and to find those solutions. And we have a, a couple of times kind of attempted, we've made this presentation over several months um, in meetings that had uh, charter and other ISP representatives on them. We attempted to, to have a meeting with some of our coalition members and charter representatives. Um, and so far I've not made a lot of headway on collaboration. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Jarrett to wrap us up and then I'm happy to answer yeah. any further questions. Absolutely. The the collaboration piece is key. And, and I know the, the good reverend who spoke earlier uh, cited, why don't you just collaborate? We would like nothing more. Uh, but what's key here is because Charter at least has stated to us that their pricing, what, what they actually have on offer is, is um, it's sort of industry secrets, right? It's not something they can make available. Um, it makes it very hard for us to have a meaningful conversation, not around the the positive universal price uh, plan that they have, but what people actually are offered. So what people are paying for is where we have seen uh, the disparity in pricing. And given the uh, economic and the racial, uh, this from the census tract data, the racial disparities, um, we uh, have, we think there is potential discrimination. For that reason, we think there are a couple of things that the city of LA through the city council could take on. We uh, encourage you all, if this is of interest, uh, again, we don't feel as if we are the final word, we are raising this as an issue that hopefully uh, a lawmaking and an investigatory body could look into. And we would encourage you to please investigate, engage with Charter, have them share their data uh, for the city of LA. Uh, and let's find out whether your constituents are paying more if they're in higher poverty census tracts. We think it is worth it, particularly given that the primary reason people don't have broadband is not because they, <laughs> they don't have broadband to their house, it's that they can't afford it. Um, this is this is a key driver of affordability, and we would encourage you all to take this seriously. And the other thing we would ask you to consider as uh, the body which, uh, through procurement contracts uh, with broadband providers, is build into those contracts fair pricing and equal access provisions, uh, ensuring that they are actually uh, doing and signing on the dotted line for what they are saying they're doing, which is giving everybody the same price in fact, and not uh, sort of de facto and not just a jure as they have asserted. Uh, so these are the things that uh, uh, we come up with. Uh, we would encourage you all, and we really do invite you to ask more questions of us, but also of the broadband providers. Uh, and, uh, and thank you very much for your time today. Great, wow. The the disparities are really sharp. Um, and I think, you know, what you've presented really warrants further discussion and for further questioning. Um, and I'm really grateful to the California Community Foundation and to both of you for doing this work and really pushing on making it much more of a public issue. I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the pricing differentials. Can you talk a little bit more about you know, where they had lower prices available to them? Were they in neighborhoods where there was competition for internet service? Um, sometimes, but not always. Uh, so, um, and, and again, uh, in the vein of things that we were kind of surprised about um, and that don't fit on these slides, but are is in the report. Um, for these addresses, we actually went to the California Broadband Interactive map where you can go in and put in an address. And for the census block, which is, of course, even smaller than the census tract, um, the ISPs report what service they provide that fastest upload and download, what services they provide over what technology. And so for each of these addresses, we also have a screenshot from the California uh, Broadband Interactive map of this is what ISPs say they offer um, to addresses in the census block. Um, and we were actually really surprised to find that um, while 
there, there was seemed to be a slight correlation to um, where better prices were offered and competition. Um, one, it didn't always go in the direction that you would think. So like um, Manhattan Beach, there was competition that made sense. Um, but like we also found, um, you know, not in this presentation because not in the city of LA, but in like Cerritos, there were addresses that were had like amazing pricing from Charter and no other competitive options. So it was a little bit confusing what we found. Um, and then we did find like a, a parts of South LA in particular um, do have access to AT&T's slower internet service, their old kind of DSL service, um, but that didn't seem to be enough of, uh, maybe not enough of a competitive factor for, for it to affect pricing. Hmm. And then the lack of internet providers across most of the city, is that unique to Los Angeles or... Yeah. No, it's a national issue. Can you issue. talk about why, you know, I, I know that there's huge investment costs in terms of laying down networks, so I can guess at why this might be the case, but can you talk a little bit more about why we have such little competition in internet provision in LA? Um, this is, uh, this is a, it's nationally true. Um, you know, uh, lots and lots of research confirms that for residential wireline, the vast majority of Americans have at most two options. Um, and that is true kind of across California and in LA County as well. Um, and a good number of the reasons are, as you said, like it's a fairly expensive um, cost to deploy. And so these um, companies, if they if there is already um, service there, then it is a can be sort of a different a difficult business case maybe. But and this is a whole other conversation, but there is also, you know, for there's quite a bit of public money um, that has been invested and continues to be available and even more available um, recently and in the coming years around deploying networks. Um, and uh, companies that already have monopolies um, do a massive amount of work uh, to ensure that they can protect their monopolies. Now, if I, I, I want to just sort add. of indicate in here what just one thing like is we want to we want to be really clear that we understand that this isn't like a judgment statement, right? These companies have a legally enforceable obligation to maximize profits. And that is true. And it is kind of on all of us to solve the problem where their legally enforceable profit maximization doesn't work hand in hand with equity maximization or quality of life maximization. And so that, you know, the, the policy fights are really kind of in that space. And Jared, I'm sorry, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I just, uh, Madam Chair, I just, I want to acknowledge sort of in your report, and Shana started to sort of acknowledge this, there has been a substantial amount of state of California investment in building out a publicly owned uh, middle mile infrastructure and a last mile, connecting the last mile. And there are absolutely some things uh, that this committee could do to support your Bureau of Street Lighting and other agencies as to connect into and take advantage of that. Um, because with that network, you would have the ability for third, third three or four, uh, uh, you know, more uh, folks to effectively compete. Right now, it's hard for competition to happen where the competitors need to actually lease the fiber of of these entities, right? Or the or in some cases the coaxial cable if it's charter. But um, so that's a challenge, and that's why uh, publicly owned fiber and a network of that um, stands to sort of hold out hope to bring down costs overall through promoting competition. Um, so I just I wanted to acknowledge that. Not that it's the it's going to solve everything. To Shana's point, equity. Um, we don't know why it's we have found it to be statistically significant that you pay more in poor communities in LA. We want the answer to that. We want you all to be curious about that and to use your powers uh, to try to find the answer to that. But we know that it's a problem and it's an equity problem on top of a sort of a social a, a, del a service delivery problem uh, to the extent that we agree everybody deserves access to broadband. We need to make sure it's affordable uh, and quality quality for everyone. Yeah, I mean, and that was really going to be my next question. Why Why do you think that this is happening? I mean, if you look at the cost of housing across low-income, high-income neighborhoods, housing costs less um, so that people in that neighborhood can afford to live in it. And with this, the opposite seems to be happening, that you're providing a service at higher costs uh, to the consumer in a place where you are likely to have fewer consumers being able to take that up. So why 
that seems like it goes against the logic of business that you'd want to have cheaper internet available in neighborhoods where the average residents can pay less. Why do you think that there is this disparity in pricing that seems to be, you know, counter to the largest number of consumer right. um, uptake? So there's, um, and, and again, I want to acknowledge that this is kind of uh, speculative on our part and why further kind of formal investigation is needed. Um, but we did have conversations because we had the same thing of like, this makes no sense from a business perspective. Um, we did have conversations with network engineers, um, in including a couple that had recently retired or left um, doing that work for Charter Spectrum in LA. Um, and their uh, best explanation to us was that kind of twofold. One is that uh, a number of these kind of lower income communities also tend to be denser. And so put uh, having everyone in those communities be subscribed at those higher service tiers puts a significantly more a heavier burden on the infrastructure that exists. Um, and so kind of using pricing to make sure that, that, uh, that what they're selling, they can actually deliver on the infrastructure that they have um, is doable. But then the second piece, and this has been pretty universal. Uh, and because, there's, sorry, there have, just, just to clarify, they're denser. Uh, and so they're afraid of having more consumers take up the service because they may not be able to provide the service yes. at the quality that they are, they're they selling. want to deliver at. Yes. That's the theory. We, we, we can't prove that. This is what some yeah, engineers. Just, I mean, I'm just asking you based on these, with like, us. what you think. And, yeah. and, and certainly and the, yeah, the we'll have of, an opportunity in. Right this committee and moving forward to be able to speak directly um, to ISPs and, and ask them these questions. So this is really not meant to be taken as fact. I understand it's speculation and yeah. The, the second sort of important piece of that, and again, those two things are of course connected, um, is that uh, where network upgrades have happened. So where Charter and, and AT&T have invested in infrastructure upgrades to be able to meet uh, kind of higher service levels and higher service demands haven't happened in those low-income communities. So you kind of put those two things together, higher demand on aging infrastructure, um, and that they may be using pricing uh, as a way to really kind of like drive what, what demand is and what they're, what they're selling there. And it's in this sense that the term redlining council member gets applied that there have been historic decisions, literally communities where there has been investment in the infrastructure, and they are now able to have uh, faster uh, at, and more affordable broadband in neighborhoods where, for whatever reason, it hasn't been deemed worthy to invest in. Um, and those now have a slower kind of legacy infrastructure Hence the need to do this pricing stuff. This is the theory that we that, that has been shared with us. I, you know, I want to be clear. I'm not an engineer. I don't know how that works. But, but the fact is, the CPUC is, you know, has been doing. And I know Shane, if you want to talk about uh, that set of hearings, because they are looking into this question. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my final question before I turned it over to my colleague. But really, just to ask. It's, you know, obviously the report was not unique to the city of Los Angeles that looked at a number of different neighborhoods um, across the county and would imagine that these issues are happening across the country based on what you presented from other researchers. What are other levels of government doing to, to, to address this issue, if anything, and if you are engaging with those other levels of government on this question already? And, and if so, what, what actions you're, you're pushing them to take? Um. Basically, every level of government is taking a look at this right now uh, because the digital divide is such a, a significant barrier to progress on so many other issues that we uh, that we work on and that uh, every level of government works on. So the FCC has a digital discrimination proceeding um, that is active and that we have been very active in. In fact, we're giving a version of this presentation to the uh, chairwoman of the FCC tomorrow um, and have engaged as commenters. Um, and we are our call to action to them as well is um, to leverage the power of the FCC to drive transparency and data collection. So if the assertion from these companies is that this isn't happening, cool. They should be. They should provide data around that um, so that we can figure out what some of the other things that are going on around affordability and adoption really are. Um, and again, this this uh, um, digital redlining issue around infrastructure. 
Um, we're also engaging um, at the state level with the administration, both actually with Attorney General Bonta, because attorney generals in other states have brought action, um, most recently against Frontier, um, that has been successful in driving um, investments and change. Also with the governor's office, um, their Department of Technology and others, um, both on policy, on um, the sort of regulatory and on legislative. We're very active at the CPUC. They have a digital discrimination, a digital redlining proceeding um, that we are engaged in. And again, are also have ensured that this information is, uh, is in that proceeding as well. And then at the county, of course. And then I think at this point, we're at 15 other cities in LA County, aside from the city of LA. Great. Uh, I wanna turn, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Bloomingfield, if you have questions. Yes, thank you, and, and thank you very much for this report. I mean, the digital divide is so important. Um, I've been focused on this for a while. I tried to create the CityLink LA as a, a home run hit, but didn't didn't happen. But we did get you're, some, you're ahead of your time, sir. <laughs> we, did, we did get some some increases in, uh, as a result of it, and uh, you want to make sure we do everything we can to enhance connectivity and and bridge this digital divide. So I'm. I'm Appreciate you bringing. It. I'm still trying to make heads or tails of you know Spectrum is as obviously expressed a lot of concerns about it. Have you seen their their sheet says false claims versus reality? I don't know if you yeah. could address some of those the, the you know directly uh, if you have that in front of you. But I mean the the, the top one <clears throat> and which you've already talked about a little bit, which is they're saying that they have this national rate that that the majority of people the, or they say the vast majority of people pay mr billingfield uh, if, if i could just interrupt for just one second um just for people who are listening in do you think you could share where you're seeing this um the fact sheet i don't know how to do that but i do, <laughs> I do oh it's it. not like it's not on their website or something i i don't know i have a copy of it but um okay no, but no problem we can you guys, uh, you guys have i know you've seen it and they've been circulating it so if you have it and can share it, that's great. I don't. I don't have it, so or, that's what I was asking you. <laughs> let, 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 I'll try and find it. Please sure continue. It to you. I, I have it. I just don't know quite how to share it without sharing everything on my computer here. Um, um, I'm happy to share my screen. I can pull it up and, and share my screen if that's helpful. That'd be great. Let me do that real quick. And just you know, wanted to get your responses to some of the some of the the direct things that they're saying, and and you know, the biggest the one which you've started to address, you know, they're saying they have this nationally consistent pricing. The vast majority of customers pay, um, you know, no data caps, no modem fees, no annual contracts. <clears throat> and is that rate available to everyone in all of these zip codes? So, and is it more or less? Is is the national rate more than all these promotional rates is that is that why that works um so i just want to be be clear again like we don't see any evidence of a national pricing i said we found jared actually did a significant amount of, of digging and found a buried page on the charter spectrum website that has links that say if you signed up for service between this date and this date, click here for standard pricing rates, or if you signed up. So we have had a very difficult time actually finding what these national pricing standards are, if they exist. Um, but, you know, kind of related to that, I guess it kind of answers its own question is, uh, I have no idea how, if you wanted to sign up for Charter Spectrum service at their standard rate, how you go about doing that. If you go, I mean, I think anybody who has tried to sign up for service at any of the ISPs, you go on the website, it doesn't say what service do you want, you go sign up, and then it says, okay, great, what address do we send the modem to? Um, you put in your address, and then it tells you what the pricing is available to you. So, um, right. you know, we uh, that's why all of our pricing is, is based on what is on their website because we went with pricing that they advertise and offer. And if I could follow up, Council Member. Um, we would invite you to actually ask Charter to share that information. We have asked for that information, and uh, th they haven't 
provided it. This is why we are left to conclude. Again, we are open if there's a price, but but what 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 we are left to conclude is that price is somewhat higher, and people, you know, what you are offered is a deal, except that the deal which poor communities get isn't as good of a deal as wealthier communities are getting. And and uh, and and as it has played out, I mean, you just need to go to the website, right? It will ask you your address. That is the only thing it asks you for, and then it tells you what your prices are. Uh, there, there's no negotiation on those prices. There's no <clears throat> statement. Uh, and so we, we, are, we are happy to be proven wrong if, in fact, there is some uh, national price, which they have certainly mentioned here, and they've right. mentioned in other fora, but that they've refused to make available to us and to others. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of on that same point, they say like most people pay X, Y, or Z. Um, again, that has not been our evidence either from what we were able to find here or from survey data. Um, again, we have 2,200 survey responses from across the state and that has not been what uh, what people tell us is true. Right. Um, but you know, would love to so see there's, a se there's a secrecy here, which is one of the reasons we think that that government, you know, sort of fora like this one, right, where there's the ability to whether compel or at least ask uh, uh, Spectrum to provide this information could really help shed light on this. Um, and then I don't, I don't know, uh, Council Member, if, it, if you want us to kind of keep going through, but happy to answer yeah, those that, specific that, that questions. That would be great if you, if you want to sort of knock out the points that are there, because that's what a lot of the callers and, and and I don't know maybe it's unorthodox, but if there's still a spectrum person on the line, uh, we could ask them to to comment. Madam Chair, I don't know if they can. Yeah, I'm I'm totally open to it. Um, I'm not sure who's here though. Let me check. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I this is the beginning of a conversation. So uh, if that. yeah, if if. We will make. I, I think we can make space in this committee for another conversation where we welcome the community foundation back and we invite uh, Spectrum. Um, that's that's I, that's that's a great idea to do. I think to to yeah because because yeah. all of us I think are all on the same page, which is horrified by the idea that that lower income people are being charged more. Totally. It, it's counterintuitive because. It doesn't seem to make business sense, but but I also understand what you're saying. If the density issue and potentially the the lack of infrastructure investment could be leading to that, you know. But, but it's just there's still this sort of odd. There's an oddity here. It doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, is it is it possible that like are we talking about different devices? Like is it possible it deals with whether someone's doing phone internet or TV or or computer or anything like that? We've done an apples to apples comparison council member so that we've tried to isolate for that. Obviously you get different prices, right? When you segregate by package. So the prices that you have seen us highlighting have been the uh, the same across all census tracts so that we have uh, so that we have the ability to, to meaningfully it's not, compare. It's not just the same internet speed, it's the same product. That you know, the exact you, same product. You yeah. know, whether it's a computer or <laughs> whatever um okay um you know we should note we did also uh just kind of in, in, again because where we started was with the experience of the communities that we uh are partnering with and the community groups that are really doing the work there um you know at least some some number of them was a relatively small but some number of them did have um verizon um or kind of wireless access at home and so right. we, and when we first started doing this, we actually did uh, for all the address we were looking at also shop for Verizon, also shop for Starry. They kind of looked at some of the other ones that didn't meet that two and a half percent threshold, but just that we were hearing from folks that they had looked at. Um, and there just wasn't, they're not available enough, widely enough for us to get more than like a data point here, a data point there. Um, and so that so just didn't. People using internet through their, through their cell phone or through like i used to get it through satellite right none of those things were were counted because those are they're just not there's not very small. widely available yeah 
And this is Michael Espinoza, the city clerk again. I just want to let you know that um, the document that you're discussing, the false claims versus reality, is on that same council file. And it's entitled Com Comment from Public. And again, you go, that, go to lacouncilfile.com and type in 22-1111-S9, and you will see that document that we are discussing right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know yeah. this was some, something of an unusual meeting, so thanks for <laughs> Well, Thanks, Mr. Espinoza, for your flexibility. And this is a good way to get more into the substance. So I appreciate it, Madam Chair. That, um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys want to comment on any on the other bullet points on there. Shana, I think you were going to comment on, on another one of them, right? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to note that um, a, a few things I think that's really important to keep in mind, big picture, is uh, we have been very, very clear, and you can't find a single instance in our report, in any of our presentations, in anything that we've said. We've been very, very clear that all of uh, everything that we're talking about is what is available to the public. So what is being advertised or offered on these addresses to the public. Um, so if the claim is that there is um, pricing and that most people pay something different than what is publicly advertised, there's no way for us to know that. <laughs> so we've been very clear about uh, kind of the, the point of our claims, which is these, this is what is available and is advertised to the public. Um, and on this kind of the second point around the annual contracts, um, again, it's sort of an, an interesting technicality. Yes, uh, I guess if you are, uh, you could at any point cancel your internet. Oh, yeah, um, sorry, just Shana, if you could just share the comment or oh, what, the, sorry. what the fact me... is, I think that would be helpful because not everybody has access to the facts versus. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so it, the say that uh, per our point around the, um, the terms and conditions. Um, and that was really, again, we focused on if you get, not only do you get offered a higher price, but you get that price for just one year before it goes up to something <laughs> um, for, that's just good for one year versus in um, lower poverty communities where that really good deal is good for a full two years. Um, that's what we were referring to and when what they quote um, in this and their answer to that is that Spectrum has no annual contract, so therefore there's not different terms and conditions. And that uh, the speeds and regular prices are the same in every zip code. Um, they do acknowledge that the length of any promotional rate um, that varies on the promotion. And to that we would say, yes. <laughs> um, so that is exactly our point. Is that the promotions are being are there are better promotions offered for a longer period of time to people who are living in wealthier communities than in the higher poverty communities where they could most benefit from that, and the the difference there is very real. I mean, one one of the folks that we talked to um, in this, and when and we 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 went through this process with community members, so we would share our screen, we would say, okay, like let's shop for service at your address and see what we can find. And there was at least one woman who literally kind of broke down into tears when we looked with her and saw what she was offered and then compared with her an address um, in Beverly Hills. And it was that $40 difference. And she started describing to us how she um, has paid basically the highest price that she could possibly figure out how to afford to Spectrum to keep her kids online. She's a single mom with three kids keep her kids online to be able to access their education. Um, and she just, she described some of the trade-offs that she made. And that $40 a month for her meant taking, for example, her blood pressure medication every other day instead of every day as prescribed so that she could put that prescription money towards the internet. And the fact that that $40 at the end of a year was going to go up to, who knows, like $60 more, $70 more than if she lived in Beverly Hills, like that's a really significant difference. For a bunch of the people that we are talking about. So yes, I guess theoretically you could say there's no contracts. And so any of us, whether you're paying a great deal or a crappy deal, you can like get out of that deal at any time. But if that's your only option for internet, um, that's that's really kind of a, a distinction without a difference. If I could just add, it's another way of maybe characterizing a council member is that it's the exception that eats up the rule, right? It's advertised as, oh, the, you know, it sounds as if it's small oh the, this is a special that we're offering but 
every time you go on their website to ask for a price, what you are being offered is the special that is special to you based on your address. Um, and it's the difference in the special price you're getting that seems to be to us, uh, that seems to be where the disparity vests, that for whatever reason, um, it is a statistically significant number of addresses show that it is cheaper in Mar Vista, Beverly Hills, Malibu, some of the wealthier communities we looked at uh, substantially uh, than poor communities. Uh, and we and we welcome and thank you both for being so curious about this. We welcome you guys continue looking because we are also interested in what those answers are. We aren't looking for a conspiracy under every rock. We're looking for more affordable broadband in our uh, more vulnerable communities that really rely on this increasingly. So. Um, and then I guess like from this uh, claims reality sheet um, that folks have access to, um, there's the same line twice. So there's a, a, a row on this sheet that is exactly the same on both pages, which makes me think that they, uh, that that's a really important objection um, from, from the charter's end. And that says, uh, it really points to kind of our political agenda um, uh, and what that might be. And I think, um, you know, I'll, uh, Jer Jared is my boss on this, so we'll, I'll open it to him to correct me, but I think we are very happy being very open about our agenda. Our agenda is driving equitable access to fast, reliable, and affordable broadband for every Angelino. That's our agenda, full stop. And I think we are more than happy to own that <laughs> as a political agenda, as a policy agenda, as a cultural agenda. Um, we own that agenda and we are we more than happy to stand behind it. That is the and, agenda we're driving. Well done, Shana. Uh, but the other, the only thing I'm gonna add is that it's not, it, there is CCF and council member Raman, if you guys do call us back, we would ask you to also call our partners in this because there are 70 community-based organizations who stand with us and have actually helped do all of this research. Um, and these are organizations, maybe you just wanna call the ones from LA, but uh, they, they, they span the county um, and they're in, involved you know, in immigration and education and housing and health, uh, you name it. Um, but all of them through their service delivery have, have seen the impact of what it means to have community members, clients not be able to access fast, reliable broadband. Um. And I think just the, the one other from, the, I mean, again, would love to kind of be able to have a conversation with charter folks on this and, and would welcome if this is a good a good venue for it in the future, happy to do that. Um, but uh, the, the other one is they, they kind of talk about the competition. And I think it's really important to note a couple of things. Like one is they, they cite uh, Broadband Now, which um, is funded by internet service providers and all of their data is provided by internet service providers. So it's a, not, not broadband now does some great research um, and we, uh, we lean on some of their research sometimes, but I think it's really important to note that in terms of how they report on availability and what the prices are and things like that, that they get all of that information from ISPs and they are funded by ISPs in order to provide it. Um, so a little bit of a grain of salt. And that also, um, again, this is sort of a, it's a technicality. Are there, um, you know, something like 50 some odd ISPs across the county of LA? There are, um, however, the vast majority of them serve tiny communities. So, you know, like Starry is an example of a fixed wireless provider that has actually partnered um, with the city of LA's um, housing authority and, and has to have, provide some great service at, at affordable rates and have done a good job of getting people, particularly in MDDs and in low income housing connected. However, they are not available to the vast majority <laughs> of, of, of Angelinos. And the same is true of all but, I said, three, arguably four, if you include T-Mobile's um, wireless service at, 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 to the home, um, there's not available. So there are, there are a ton. And this actually gets to, in some ways, some of our kind of fourth call to action that we didn't talk about at all, but it's like there is tons of room to actually partner with independent, more community-driven, locally-based providers of service um, and to maybe make those more available and accessible to Angelino so you do have more competition. Um, that, is, that is key and actually kind of gets to one of the drivers of um, kind of how we arrived here, which is we were alerted to a, a charter contract, a $30 million five-year contract that the city is considering renewing with charter 
And our claim, our ask here is not that the committee or the council not approve that contract. Our ask is that they take the opportunity Uh-oh. Yeah, this happens sometimes when we're talking about charter spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll finish yes, if that's I, okay. I, yeah, we think we can guess I'll, what. I'll finish up that, that you all can actually ask these questions as part of that and include a provision uh, that really that requires um, equity in pricing, that requires equal pricing, not just on the the term sheet, of but in what to people take a are look actually at charged. If that can be answered in that process, and Oop, get more Shana, driven, that sorry to interrupt you, Shana. You have froze for the last thirty seconds, and I finished your point. She froze again. Yes. All right. Mike, Thank you, Michael, guys. If, yeah, Michael, you might need to mute her if you can. Um, all right. So, uh, Mr. Bloomfield, did you have any additional questions here? No, I, I think this is we've we've started a, a really good conversation on this, and yeah. and it's. Mm-hmm. Gonna issue and I know it's just an informational item uh, but thank you for bringing it forward and and for the robust conversation we so appreciate your curiosity and your engagement thank you and we stand ready uh, with our resources and our partners uh, stand ready to support any questions you might have now and going forward Um, great so I you know I think at this time I'm I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna also say thank you to both of you for for making the presentation and for doing the report and for being out there and talking about the implications of it Um, as I said uh, at the beginning of this uh, conversation I think this was really just an opening up of a a line of questioning that I think is important for the city of Los Angeles to open up um, particularly given the information in the report and my hope is that we can have a future committee meeting where we have representatives from our internet service providers, particularly Spectrum because our charter because of their uh, coverage in this area, but you know the others as well. And just to ask them the same questions uh, around these disparities that we were able to ask you um, and to have a healthy dialogue about how we can address those disparities in ways that really uh, improves access to broadband here in, in this city. Um, And since broadband is so essential, I think this is really worth grappling with as we move forward. So with that, I want to thank you both. And I think at this point, if we have nothing else on on this agenda, we can adjourn the regular meeting and move on to the special meeting. Yes, the desk is clear for this this meeting. So, yes. Great. And now we are ready to start the special meeting. Mr. Espinoza, can you call the roll? Thank you. Councilmember Rahman. <laughs> Councilmember Rahman? Here. Councilmember Blumenfield? Present. And Councilmember Price? Councilmember Price is currently absent, so that's two members and a quorum for our special meeting. Great. <clears throat> we have three items to consider on the special agenda. Um, item one is a renewal of a private telecommunications franchise for the California Hospital Medical Center, um, Hope Street Family Center. Item two uh, and item three are both motions related to um, security measures and protocols. Um, One is for uh, protocols in place uh, for um, detecting novel attacks um, for cyber attacks, basically, that could particularly those that can place our city's critical infrastructure in jeopardy. And item three um, is a motion about an application process for the Department of Homeland Security state and local cybersecurity grant program. So um, those are our three items. Uh, We have to take public comment on them. So at this time, I'm going to take public comment on all items on the agenda. And once again, speakers are going to have a minute if they're speaking on one item, two, if they're speaking on multiple items. And Mr. Espinoza, could you please provide the instructions to the public to participate in our special meeting? Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on this special agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-892-0108. I'll repeat that. That's 161-892-0108 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak.
Callers, please select star nine if you wish to speak. And no one has raised their hand, Councilwoman, so there are no callers in the queue. Great. So um, just want to ask our city attorney whether that's fine for fulfilling our public comment. Yes, it is. Great. So let's move on to our items. I'm going to recommend that we take items one and three on consent, unless there are any objections. Nope. Okay, great. Uh, can you call the roll, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Aye. And Councilmember Price is absent, so that's two ayes, and these items are approved on consent. Okay, and for item two, I believe we have, oh, Ted, we have you. Uh, is that, so you're going to be making the presentation? I'll make introduction, Madam Chair. Oh, so fantastic. Okay, yeah, oh, and I have Tim. Well, I'll make introduction to Timothy Lee. So, okay. Ted Ross, General Manager with the Information Technology Agency. Um, look, sir, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we just have to read the item into the record. Thank you. Item number two is a report from the Information Technology Agency in response to a motion from Council Members Lee and Rahman relative to sec uh, security measures and protocols in place to detect novel attacks in real time and either, any other form of advanced cyber attack that could, be, that could place critical inf infrastructure in jeopardy. Great. And I'll turn the floor over to you, Ted and Timothy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you can imagine, cybersecurity has always been an important conversation, but I think during the COVID pandemic, the move to hybrid teleworkers, the moving of all sorts of city services and critical services online, uh, you know, even just the conversation that we previously had around digital equity and about digital inclusion, cybersecurity has been a renewed effort at the city of Los Angeles. So with that, I'd like to introduce our chief information security officer who's been with the information technology agency. His name is Tim Lee to provide an overview related to this item. Thank you, thank you, Ted. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Tim Lee, chief information security officer of RTA. Um, city of Los Angeles cyber defense strategies are based on two guidance. Uh, one is the mayor executive director number two, and second is the mayor cyber security framework. So as an overview, our strategy includes four uh, elements. Uh, number one, uh, prevent attacks targeted to city of Los Angeles. Number two, protect the critical infrastructure and digital assets. And number three, detect the malicious uh, uh, threats from insiders and outsiders. And number four is a response and mitigate the cyber threats and attacks. So to operationalize these strategy with these four key elements, um, <clears throat> City of Los Angeles, we uh, design and build the Integrated Security Operations Center, Integrated SOC, uh, in 2015. So this platform provides the collective defense uh, platform for all city departments to uh, analyze, detect, and, and then respond to key uh, critical cyber incidents. Uh, including the proprietary departments. So currently integrated SOC, uh, we are analyzing uh, daily average about 1 billion uh, security records. And then we are blocking about 2 million intrusion, uh, network intrusion uh, daily. And then also we are mitigating about uh, 200 uh, malware uh, per month. And also integrated security operations center also contribute back to the uh, business communities with providing uh, actionable threat intelligence. So we built the established the uh, uh, LA Cyber Lab and, and it is uh, first um, public private uh, partnership in the cyber defense uh, lead by uh, uh, local governments. And also uh, we closely partnership with our federal partners, law enforcement, and then also the um, uh, MSI SAC to uh, collaborate on the cyber defense and share the action about the intelligence. Uh, so recent cyber attacks on local governments and school districts remind us again and again the importance of cyber uh, security. And cyber security uh, is a team effort and, and also ongoing. So with the mayor's uh, leadership and your support, uh, we continue to drive on um, protecting the city digital uh, infrastructure and a digital assets that provide quality service to your engineering Um I will stop here and I'm happy to answer your question uh, and thank you for your time.
Thank you. I want to open up the floor for questions, Mr. Bloomfield, if you have any. Sure. Um, Councilmember Lee's motion specifically asked about whether the city's cybersecurity efforts included this what's called third wave AI as defined by DARPA and uh, NSC AI. I didn't see that specifically addressed in the report. I know that there are probably sensitivities about uh, publicly discussing highly specific details on cybersecurity, but uh, are you able to respond to that instruction uh, as that that was you know, specific to this motion? Yes, um, since the state of Los Angeles, our overall cyber strategy adopted NIST cybersecurity framework. And then um, it's a, one of the things, the first category of the NIST cybersecurity framework was to identify. So identify all the application that include the, within the application, if you have an AI or machine learning process, that's include in that category for the protection and detection. So, um, so for, for the AI and, and then machine learning process, they included in the web, um, overall application and process and procedure. That's uh, also part of our overall protection strategy from the, uh, uh, from the other cyber strategy. And council member, I think if I may, one thing that's useful in this topic uh, artificial intelligence is utilized in the intrusion pre prevention and intrusion detection software that we utilize. So the types of appliances and the tools that we use, we won't name vendors or name names, but we use tools that utilize that type of technology to be able to provide uh, identification, detection, prevention of those types of cyber attacks. Right, and and I, I admittedly, I know I am. You guys are the experts on this. I am not. I don't know the difference between artificial intelligence and third wave artificial intelligence as defined by DARPA and NSCAI. I just know that that <clears throat> term was specifically called out. Is third, is, and maybe, maybe it's a distinction without a difference. I don't know. But is that just so that we know that we're answering the question that was called in the motion, is that included in, 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 in this report, or is that part of that third? And maybe you could tell us what is third wave AI. Yeah, I just know that it's, that's it, it is like me, but yeah. So, so council member, I would assert that it is a distinction without much of a difference. Generally speaking, artificial intelligence. So we we've heard a lot regarding artificial intelligence in use cases. One of the most robust use cases actually comes down to things like cybersecurity. So. Often it's a technology that gets sold in a lot of different areas, but cybersecurity is an area in which it can have some effective use. And it comes down to really a key specific item. So typical traditional cybersecurity is signature based, which means they're looking for existing known malware. And once they find it, they say, I know you, you are known malware. The problem is that malware is constantly changing. And so artificial intelligence and those tools are baked into vendor products to be able to identify not just signatures that are known, but also behaviors that are not known. And so that type of heuristics is where artificial intelligence becomes very useful. The, that is specifically useful for when we have what are called zero day attacks. That means somebody is using malware that the world has never seen before, that is not known by antivirus software, and then they use that attack on your network. The city of Los Angeles has been hit by multiple zero day attacks in which the tools that we leverage by and large identified that using the types of heuristics that we're discussing to say, I may not know you as a specific signature of malware. However, I know that you were behaving like malware and I will quarantine you and I will escalate it up to the IT security team for you to do further analysis. And so those are the types of areas where artificial intelligence is utilized. And third wave does AI, is that, is that a, meaningful term? I think in the context of this, it is not a significant meaningful term. Okay, thank you. Was that all your questions? That's it. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think, you know, looking over um, the report, which was brief and, and your presentation today, I mean, I think this is, um, Something that I know Mr. Lee is very um, focused on is cybersecurity, and I think it's important for the city to make sure that we are doing everything that we are able to make sure our systems are safe, as you said, particularly given 
how much we rely on them now. Um, I believe that this report is informational only, right? So we don't have any action to be taken on it and I'm comfortable um, at this point. I don't have any further questions. And I wanna thank you both for your presentation. Um, and I guess at this moment time, we can adjourn the special meeting and move back to our regular one. Is that right? Well, what we would do is um, we can um, file this as a note and file. Okay, great. And we would just adjourn the special meeting and then we'd be finished with this, this whole um, full meeting. Okay, so we'll, uh, so we'll note and file this, uh, this item. Do we need to take a vote on that? Um, yeah, let's take a vote on it. Um, Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield? No, no, just kidding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, the item's passed. Thank you so much, Mr. Ross, Mr. Lee, mm. for presenting um, and for doing the work and look forward to staying in touch on these issues um, as we move forward as well. Thank you. And so now we're going to adjourn the special meeting and move back into our regular meeting, right? Or well, no, because we already adjourned that meeting. So once we adjourn the special, the meeting is now uh, oh, at a wait. close. Then I want to say something because today is our last meeting with Yvette Serna as our staffer from my office on it. Um, Yvette, uh, just wanted to thank you um, for everything you've done for um for this committee for moving us forward this was the first you know my my first time chairing a committee and Yvette really came to us from the controller's office um knew the city much better than I did and and great and I was really really grateful to have her guidance through all of this Yvette are you there she was sick today I'm, so. I'm here yeah I'm sorry I can't show my face I'm a little under the weather but thank you so much council member it's been a pleasure to work with you and a pleasure to work with the departments that report to this committee. Um, but I am very excited that, you know, I think I, I'll continue to work with everyone here. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. And Michael is going to be moving, moving to council district one as the new council members, chief of staff. So congratulations to Yvette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to continue to work with you in that new role. Me too. Me too. All right, so now with that, we can adjourn this meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>